We shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. That's what Marshall McLuhan told us um, in the previous century. And I really believe this is true. Now, the interesting thing is that when we, when, you know, by changing this, by changing the perspective, we just um, open up new possibilities that were just not thinkable before. Not just by, uh, by us, the creators of the tool. People are starting to use these tools in ways that we have just not predicted before. And so that trend will just continue. And um, the consequence is that when I look at my environment, I find myself smiling a lot more than I used to. And remember, because the main enemy here is frustration. The problem is that when you, put, when you have so much responsibility, the whole world is being built on what you are creating right now. You want that you want to take, you, to take that responsibility seriously. And unhappy people are unlikely to create happy solutions. So, looking at how many times people smile is not an unuseful um, indicator. So, so, last year I gave concrete hands-on examples of how workflows, classic workflows from debugging, inspection, um, can be radically different using the tools we have. Now, those workflows were technical things. But I, I just described technical problems. But technical problems um, are interesting to solve, and indeed they are relevant here, but if we really want to have an impact, we have to change the business. So today I want to talk about how we had the opportunity to work with the business and rethink the way our workflow inside the business. So I'll tell you a story um, for the majority of the, uh, of the, of the time. So the, the story was that in December last year we, were, we started to work with a company called Orderbird, which is a startup in Berlin, and um, they are one of the most prominent uh, players on the market of point of sale systems. How many of you know what a point of sale is? So a point of sale, for those that don't, because not everybody does, um, for those that don't, essentially, and this is specifically in the restaurant or the hospitality area. So that's when you know, a waiter comes to you and says, well, what do you want to order? And then they say, I want a pizza or I want a salad. And then they type something in and then they go, they bring you the thing after a while. And then at the end of it, you pay. Right, that's a point of sale, and that's a digital solution. And so that's the market in which Orderbird was appearing. And then um, they wanted to do something larger. So instead of looking at their business as only point of sale, um, they said, well, can we not imagine a system that automates restaurants? Like everything in the restaurant, all communications that are happening in between, including ideally even the conversation between the waiter and and the, and the guest. So that's a different system. It's based on a on a different type of a metaphor. And um, we 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 started to work with them to build um, to build a new model. So what we got from Orderbird was a sketch um, to start with an idea. It was a beautiful idea. And actually, that idea was already uh, partly implemented in Faro as a prototype. So the idea with that we sketch kind of looked like this. So <coughs> we have, imagine you have a, a venue, let's call it the cozy corner venue. And in that venue you have two, uh, two parts. You have a room and you have a kitchen. And in the room you have two tables and in the kitchen you have two stations. Uh, like the warm station when you cook the warm food and the cold station when you cook the cold food, like salads. And in this restaurant there are two persons, John Waiter and Jeff Cook. And they are associated with the different specific areas, right? So the areas that you see in the gray, they form a tree. And then we talk also about contributors, 
which are the, in our case, our characters, um, and they can be associated with any parts of the area. Now, both areas and contributors are actors, and they can send messages around. So let's imagine that um, uh, John Winter goes to table one and talks with uh, um, talks with uh, with the guest, and the guest says, "Oh, I want to order a sandwich." So uh, and John Waiter says, "Okay," and he digitalized John Waiter digitalizes that information, and he wants to now send the message that uh, I want to uh, order a product. So what he does is that he, he could directly send it to the cook, but he doesn't do that. What he wants is to say, "I don't know who's going to uh, who's going to." Um, who's going to handle this message, I just know that it's, it's relevant for the table. It's in this context that it happened. Now the table doesn't know what to do with the message, so it forwards it upwards. It goes to the room, the room also doesn't know what to do with it, so it gets all the way to Cozy Corner. Now Cozy Corner does know what to do with placing orders, because that's the business of Cozy Corner, to take orders and you know, uh, deliver things and then get money out of it. So what Cozy Corner does, and all other things, it says, oh, now I got an order, and that's something that the um, that models I got a message saying that there's an order inside, and that's something that is relevant for the customer. But for, the, for my cook, I need to transform it into a more technical kind of a message. So I want to change that message and move to create a new message. And that message is, let's say, um, the produced product message. And so now we we send that message and Cozy Corner goes, oh, somebody in the kitchen knows how to deal with this. So somebody in the kitchen also doesn't know what to do, but he knows that somebody at the workstation knows what to do with it, or the cold station. And uh, eventually the message gets to the cook. So now the waiter just communicated with the cook, but without necessarily having any, any direct communication uh, in between. So this is, it's a kind of an actor, uh, actor message model. Um, and uh, to, to specifically mapped for uh, for the communication inside that those kinds of spaces. Okay, so now at this moment the cook has a to-do list, right? So a new item appears on the to-do list of the cook. So after a while, right, the cook looks at the to-do item, and then after a while, he cooks the cook, he cooks the food, and says, "Oh, now I'm done." So when he says that I'm done, he says wants to send a message that somebody should come up and deliver it. And um, that message, uh, he sent it to the station where we worked. Um, and of course, the station doesn't know what to do with it, and it propagates it further, all the way to Cozy Corner. And Cozy Corner knows, oh, I don't know what to do with it, but somebody in the room does, somebody at the table does, and it eventually gets to the waiter. So now the waiter gets a, a list on his to-do item, go and pick it up, and after he picks it up, he goes, uh, he goes and does it. So is it clear? Who's with me? <laughs> okay, so let's see how does this look like in, in, in the environment. So we started in December, and in January we did the, the following demo. So here we have a um, um, little script. We create the cook, the cozy corner, the kitchen, which is inside the cozy corner, then we have a, a station which is inside the kitchen, and the cold another station which is inside the kitchen, and the room which is in the cozy corner. So who can follow the, the, the who can follow the script? But you can follow the script, but perhaps this is easier, isn't it? Right? It's it's slightly not the same. So um, and the idea is that we can now create things inside the environment, and then you can see the visualization that goes next to it, right? It's not as beautiful as the one we can draw by hand, um, but, um, but nevertheless useful. Okay, so let's move on. So now we can con construct um, this, this further. So I already have here a script which is slightly larger. So let's take a look at the script. So this script shows a um, cozy corner um, and shows a room and a kitchen and the room has two tables associated with John Waiter and called the Worm Station associated with Jeff Cook. Right? Is everybody on board with that? Now the interesting thing that I showed you here right, 
is that there are messages that are being sent around. Right? In fact, that's the interesting thing. Up to here, we just have static structure. Now, when we send messages, we notice that somebody is able to send a message and somebody is able to uh, react to a message, handle a message. Right? So, for example, the posting quarter got a red message and produced, as a result, produced a blue message. So, we need some sort of a transformation. We call this one a message handler. So, what we have here is um, that a few message handlers, you see them in gray over here. So, cozy corner, if I now click on that, um, I get here, if I get an order product, then pr um, generate a produce product message. And the cook over here says, if I get a produce product message, uh, put it in my queue, and once I do something, create a deliver product message. And the John waiter over here says, um, if it's a deliver product, and if I am the one that generated this, uh, the message, then uh, you know, put it in my queue and afterwards do something with it. So who's, who's with me on that? Okay? But again, now, let's end. Because now we went into the static side, we just read code, which is, um, you know, sometimes it's interesting, but not really so interesting. So let's do this again. So I'm going to look at Cozy Corner here, and, but at this moment I want to order a steak. So I want to order a steak. And when I order the steak, what do I see? I see the red message that goes from John Waiter all the way to Cozy Corner. And then the blue message that goes from Cozy Corner to Kitchen to Workstation and then to Chef Cook. Right? So what is to this one then? Now come on, exercise is good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, now what do we know now? Now we know that Jeff Cook should have a to-do item, right? Yes? So if I click on Jeff Cook now, there's a to-do item over here, it says, well, you need to be able to do something with it. So now if I say, okay, what happened? Right? If I say I'm done with I'm producing my, my steak, um, the information flew back with the delivery message and it reached John Waiter. So now John Waiter should, um, should have the, the something on the queue. So if I click on John Waiter, I get here to do, and Jeff Cook has an empty to do. Okay? Clear enough? Awesome. So let's do some more of this. So here's now John Waiter creating a sandwich. So we create a sandwich, and um, John Waiter sends it further, cozy corner, cozy corner, transforms it, and ooh, something is funny here. A sandwich is cold, but it goes to the worm station. So we have a bug, but it's not really like a technical bug, it's a business bug. Because maybe the worm station needs to log how many cold or worm items were there, for example. Or maybe there needs to be some sort of schedule involved. So in that situation, perhaps we need to enhance now the, the script. So let's do just that. So here's the next stage. So here we basically introduce some message handlers just for the code in the workstation and change a little bit the messages. So let's see what happens now. Uh, we execute the code. We execute this code and look at cozy corner. It's the same cozy corner. And now when we order the steak, uh, this message goes to the worm station. Now notice how we introduced a new, a new step in between. So now the, 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 we introduce a new message, right? So the the, the, the sign thing does no longer denote delivery, it denotes another message. In this case, it's the cook message. And then if I now order the sandwich, it goes to the call station. So at this moment now, because I, I generated two messages, Jeff Cook has two to two items. Right, and one of them is the one we're looking at, and one is not. Right? So if I click on that, then I can see the delivery going back to the right thing. So who's with me on that? Okay, so the idea here is that restaurants are incredibly contextual. 
So they look kind of similar, but they really aren't. So the problem there is that this is not a configuration problem, this is a programming language problem. So we need to create a system that is programmatically able to be molded to that specific context. But if we create, every time you create a programming language, you should also create the tools that help you decompose that language, right? Inspection, de inspectors, debuggers, right? Because that's the responsible thing to do. Anything shorter than that is irresponsible. So that's what's not, a, not right from the very beginning, because it sh it, it's the responsibility of the people that produce the language to shape the tools that are useful to decompose the results of using that language. And it's the same thing here. So now what you've seen here is that because we showed, like this visualization is already useful for you to, real, to, to connect to a domain that you have never seen before, and it just took a couple of minutes. But now the assumption here was that this model was a good enough model to start adapt or adopting all sorts of different kinds of workflows. And if this was true, then we said, well, what kind of a workflow that we have never thought about could we just plug in? <coughs> and then um, we came up with the idea of, oh, what about um, the situation of, um, of a career? So in this situation, we introduce a new actor. And that one is taught career. So that's like a, an ordering service, right? You maybe order online, and uh, obviously the ordering service, the, the career, right, should, should broker the, uh, the, the ordering and the delivery of messages, but the delivery is not to, shouldn't go to a table. Right? That's the interesting thing. Now, the difference between the third script and the fourth script is exactly one single message handler. Nothing else changed. So we just added the new message handlers for top career, which is um, um, this specific one over here. So that's it. That was the only thing. We just added a new thing. But let's see what happens. So in this case, we have a sandwich. Sorry, we have a, a steak ordered for, by John Waiter. And notice how John Waiter sends it. Um, a steak order and goes all the way to cook. The cook says, oh, I have a to-do item. And the delivery, it's important, goes to John later. Right? But now, if I have a Todd Courier here, then Todd Courier sends it to the cozy corner. Notice how the rest of the workflow is the same. But now what happens if Jeff Cook presses on the to-do that it's done? It should be delivered. Who should get the message? Well, obviously, the career should get the message, right? So, and it does. So that was the first thing that we saw. Wow, this means that we can actually go from, uh, we, can, we have a chance of, of tackling this variability inside the, uh, in the hospitality uh, domain. And um, this model is, is a promising one, right? So we have, it took about a month to implement this. Okay. So, so basically, we took, we, in a month, we went from this picture to that picture. So we showed this demo to, to the developers, the technical people at Orderberg, and then we started to see, we'll talk about what, what are the implications here. So two of them are already here. So Chris and Eduardo, feel free to just wave them. And feel free to talk with them uh, afterwards if you want to hear their, their side of the experiences of the experience. So, now think that this is not a small top system. So, the order bird delivers a mobile application, and those mobile applications are actually implemented in Java and in Swift. And, um, and then, you know, on the web you have JavaScript, and the server side is actually Java. It isn't Fara. And so people thought, well, you know, but this, you know, work with Fara, perhaps it will just add costs without real delivering value, because we're just now creating a new language. But, so we, we showed this, uh, we showed this to developers, and then we immediately started to think, oh, what are the implications, can we do it? Yes, we probably can. Um, and th there was a very healthy conversation. But then we showed the same demo, right? Code on the left-hand side, and, um, and pictures on the right-hand side. We showed the, de the same demo to product managers. And we started to have a conversation about uh, modeling the domain. 
and the opportunities on the business area that in the business area that this this model uh, opens up. Then we showed it to the top manager. And they could understand what it is about, and uh, and then you know commit funds uh, to continue the project. But that was not all. The really interesting thing is that we demonstrated this to the financial uh, financial investors of the startup. The financial investors of the startup have no idea about technology. I mean, they don't understand programming necessarily. They are financial investors. And we showed this one and we had concrete conversations about what this means for the business. Now, in fact, this was a scientific experiment because we showed exactly the demo that you have seen right now. And everybody in the organization, all the way to the financial investors, could relate to it and have a meaningful conversation as a result of seeing the demo. Now, perhaps this is not new. We have seen demos that were, they were, able, you know, were able or consumable by different kinds of people. However, this demo here does not show a user perspective. This demo here demonstrates an algorithm. That's the difference. We are talking, we have just raised a few objects at the very high business decision making level. Now again, perhaps this was done before, but never at this cost. It took us about 20 lines of code to produce that visualization. <coughs> that visualization was actually useful during development. It was a natural byproduct of the development. We didn't, there was nothing special that we did for the demo. We have created the tool as a natural work, as part of the natural workflow. And as a result, the system became understandable, approachable. That's the difference. And so if you look at this one, right? And again, the amazing thing was that we could have conversations showing an inspector at a very high financial uh, level, which to me in itself is amazing. But here's the other amazing thing. So, as I said, this system is actually implemented in Java and in Swift. And we know, for example, that for the Java system, we, can, we know what is the difference in the implementation between the Faro system and the Java system. Why? Because we have moves. Right? So we can analyze and look at the difference. And we have reports that show us, look, you're missing this concept or this concept is implemented differently. Um, in, in Java or in Fire. So we go to a very good degree of accuracy what the differences are between the intention because what this became became an executable requirements document. So instead of us writing Word documents or Confluence documents only, we produce this. Right? And this was the, the document that then unifies the conversation with the different stakeholders. But now the interesting thing is that because this is executable, and because I have a way to go and analyze both statically and also dynamically um, differences between systems, this is a computational system, it means that now I can actually see the traceability between my requirements and the implementation in the real system. Which is amazing. Now, but here's the thing. Because I know that, I can also tell you that this object inspected right here is the same message that you have seen here. These two things are the same. Now, do you, can you have a conversation about the thing on the left? No, you can't. The only difference between the two systems is the picture to the right. That's the only difference. And that's the thing that made the difference 
between an opaque system and something that invites a conversation. That is what I think the future of software should look like. You could not generate the Java code. Oh, yeah, well, well we, there's a whole discussion there. We didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't want to because there needs to be variability. Every time you implement something in, in the real target system, there's, there's variability that comes from there, and you want to accommodate that difference. Uh, and it's not just the structure structure, because this is a very rich object model with real behavior in it. So um, there's going to be different ways in which you implement those into different into different languages. And you want to allow for that variability. Yes. How does this compare to some of the stuff Stephen Curry did with Meta Case? Now again, the difference, the main. So the question is, how is this this dif uh, different differ from what people from Meta Case are doing? What we are talking about here, we are talking about things that cost minutes. The difference between, like, have people used visualizations to display interesting things or algorithmic things? Yes, of course they have. Have they done it in a way that is so cheap that everybody can do it? No. And that's the difference between having 10 million developers, or whatever the population is right now, uh, being unhappy most of the time, and starting to smile most of the time. <laughs> and that's a big thing because everything we do will affect everything from now on. This is a huge responsibility. And so just top details matter in this specific case. That's a difference. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is an industry standard tool used everywhere and praised for its usability. That's the effective solution. Probably orders of magnitude cheaper. So that's what we're talking about. Now, when um, so who, who was with me on that? But that's are you excited? Because I am. I think this is so cool. We had no idea that this would work out so quickly, so easily, so smoothly at that level um, because we've never done this before. And that's really, really a game changer, I think. And we're going to go in this direction more and more. But let me just show you. So do I have um, yes. a few more minutes? Yes. Okay. Five minutes. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of more demos. So one of them is, like, real examples are, like, nowadays, are slightly more complicated. So let's look at that. Um, here's an example. I already start from an existing example. Because all the conversations that we are having, all the demos that we get, are actually capturing something uh, we call examples. So um, here I have uh, some examples um, in, in Cozy Corner. So you notice that maybe Cozy Corner is slightly more complicated with uh, more guests and so and let's say that we want to now place a message uh, place an order over here so we place the order notice how the order in this case are have four items inside so we have quinoa salad steak sandwich chicago burger and fries and when i do it here and it's, it's all fine uh, it goes from john waiter to jeff cook and what we want to do now is that I'm not going to sim I'm not going to click on Jeff Cook's to do. I'm just going to simulate it to do it. So notice how things change over here. So he, he acknowledges the first one, the second one, um, and then John Waiter <coughs> wants to cancel the first item, and then uh, John Waiter wants to deliver the, the, the second item, and then uh, the cook cancels the third item. So notice how lots of stuff happens there. But the picture is more difficult to understand, isn't it? Right? Like, we got difficult, like, we didn't understand it either. So then we said, okay, let's start again, because this is not good enough. So, um, so let's do it, let's do this, um, let's do this demo again. So we, we, we re-evaluate the script. And now, we're going to send the message first. But now instead of looking at this one, we're going to look at something we call the consequence graph. So now you see I have, I started the place order, and now I produce an order, so let's click on that. So if I click on this, 
I can see this is the place order. And the second one, if I just look at the produce order, I see only the, that, that path of the, of the game. Okay, so let's see what happens now. If Checkhook says to do item, then I get here delivery notification and a delivery notification for the second one. John Waiter cancels the first one, so I can see there is more cancelling going on here. Let's quickly see how the cancelling is happening. So you see, I can actually inspect everything that goes on in there, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, because we just built the debugger there, right? And John Waiter has a two item, it cancelled it, and we can, or delivered it, and cancelled the second one. I can see what's going on there. But maybe sometimes not even this one is good enough. So let's do this one again, but this time in the, with a different metaphor. So with a different, uh, with a different tool. Um, so I will, I will execute this again. And now I won't show you in the inspector, which is a postmortem debugger. I want to show it to you in the live debugger. So let's switch to that debugger. So now I'm at runtime, right? And I want to say, oh, let's switch to the next actor. And then to the next actor. That's cool. So who thinks that's cool? But, and this is mind boggling the interesting thing is that this is mind boggling cheap to do. But like you learn it once, and then you just use this thing, the same skill, over and over again for technical things, all the way to solving business problems. Right? And then the other cool thing is that if you have them like this, you can also, for example, go and look at log files. Right? So here's how navigating the log files looks like. It completely changes the equation, right? At very, very, very small costs. So I could go on and on um, showing you things. And now again, remember that I have not shown you one piece of UI. We could also, also show you UI, for example, on top of Seaside. You just do a part of it and then continue the rest of the workflow inside the inspector, which is amazing for having business conversations because you don't have to validate everything in order to figure out the whole picture. Right? You don't have to have a whole full UI until you get feedback. Right? It's amazing. So what have we done uh, here? We think that we have come up with a different way of organizing development. So first of all, we could tell stories with our system. Uh, we call this demo-driven design. Um, then we could... We did this one because we captured everything we have done through examples. Examples document all these executable objects and interesting objects. But not only do they document them or capture them in form of, let's say, methods, but they, you can also use the same thing as for test purposes because examples can host assertions. And those examples are the starting point for the next conversation. Right? And that's amazing because you can actually, leave, uh, and we have forced all the business to go and always specify requirements, not in terms of abstract terms, um, uh, but in terms of examples. So we don't talk about ordering a uh, multi-choice multi uh, product, but we talk about the pizza problem. Right? The pizza problem is you, you choose, um, you, you have the, the basics, but then you choose the topic. Right? And that's a multi-choice kind of problem. It's just specified in a different way. Now, we have, by the examples by themselves are already interesting, but they are even more interesting because of the approach through the human, done through the human assessment lens. The idea that every the software is the most contextual piece of um, uh, work that we have ever created as human species, and as a consequence, we cannot predict what we need. So the only solution there is to delegate the creation of the contextual tools to the context, and that's the only possible way to to, um, uh, to, to tackle the context in, in an effective manner. And um, finally, um, all of this was possible because of the multiple environment. Right? And this is what makes it practical. And that's the difference between theory and practice. Right? So that's what we kind of mean a little bit by approachable software. Now, just final couple of words. So we built this
tools, right? Um, but in fact, maybe they were they seem like new, but for people watching more closely, you might have noticed that we stopped producing the tools about two, two three years ago. We didn't really release new tools, we just released them you know, one at a time, but in fact the work was done significantly before. And the reason for that is because we have decided to invest all our energy into joining the block effort. Who knows the block project? So the block project is the redesign of the graphical interface um, of, uh, of the graphical stack of Faro. This was initiated by Alain Plantec and Stéphane Ducasse, and there were several other uh, contributors, the uh, most notable one being Len Calarno. And, um, and so we at Fink, we joined, the, we joined the project a couple of years ago, and since then we just worked our way upwards, and we started from the canvas. That's the amazing thing. You don't get much, you know, many chances you have to do that, but um, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. Now, why is this important? Well, because we have seen here that changing the characteristics of the tool can dramatically have deep implications later on. And then we notice, when we implemented Spotter, we noticed that Morphic is a dead end. We couldn't do what we wanted to do. And what we wanted to do was not to build tools, but to design new experiences. And so we worked our way up, and then this year is the first year when we actually started to see, see the light. And the, the last thing that um, I want to show you is, um, is a thing which we call the moldable editor. Anybody heard of that before? Like, if not, then you should by the end of today, because they will be also part of the Innovation Awards. Um, so, like, here's a, a quick thing. Here's a, here's a little uh, document that we wrote in, in, uh, in February about the reference model. So this is the model uh, for the, we call it the reference model for, uh, for the hospitality. So what you see here is the, the pictures that I showed you before, it's a PDF, right? Um, and then um, afterwards you, we have, okay, executing on the original idea, and you have these screenshots. But these screenshots were produced where? Well, they were produced automatically, they were not hand-drawn, but then we took the screenshots of that and then put it in the document, like you normally do, right? This is what people do when produce, they, they produce documentation. Right? Of course not. No, most people don't do that. Um, but, um, um, but normally, very often, people actually end up doing that. So a lot of the work, both in writing and in, in reading and consuming documentation, um, is actually not happening inside, inside the development environment. But given that documentation is a, it's an important piece of us going around developing our systems, it should follow that um, if we really are going to build an integrated development environment, um, then we, we build it, um, we should have both of those activities inside the environment. Now, of course, it is not new that we can produce PDFs out of runtime data, right? Or that we can produce uh, web pages out of runtime data. This is not new. But what's perhaps a little bit more new um, is how we look at this. So in fact, well, in this case, this was in February, and then just a couple of weeks ago, we, we, we reached a, a little bit of a milestone with our editor to show what can we do with it once we have it. So we have uh, here's a pillar. So who knows what pillar is? It's only a very simple markdown language. It's nothing really complicated. Um, but the interesting thing is that you can do pictures inside. But if I can have pictures, then they can also be expanded right in place. Right? Why not? If you really have the possibility of rendering, control the possibility of rendering, all sorts of new possibilities that are otherwise left for the web, or for the PDF, or some other kinds of mediums, are now possible. Um, but if this is possible, more interesting is what happens once we have live information, right? So here's an example, one of these examples that I showed you before, right, which captures a specific workflow, and this is a real rendering. I mean, this is actually happening live. This rendering here is just, just produced right now, right in place. Like you would have with a very rich uh, text editor, right? And then here's another one over here. Um, but more 
interesting is then we can get to, so if you look here at this document over here, right, we say, oh, here's some piece of code, which is very often something you do when you're writing documentation. So, you notice here that I said, oh, I want this another example here, and this is a unary method. And um, so this example here is, is an executable, because that's, what ex that's part of the definition of examples, which means that I can also look at it. I can execute it right in place, right? So I can have that kind of thing. But now the problem is that these examples build on top of other examples, right? So um, if I want to see how these things build on top of that, I can always click on things and I can expand uh, my, uh, my, my other dependencies right in place. And finally, um, once we started to have this um, possibility of representing things in different ways, we, we did another one. We said, well, can we reinvent the transcript? Right. So here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a transcript. We just open it live, and now in this case we're going to set up. Uh, uh, we're going to set up a little animation that is happening inside block, and this animation is just doing something. And let's say that we want to debug it, right? So let's start the animation. This is a transcript. We just next put all whatever things in there, right? And this is a transcript, but you can also you know, you can expand and, and do whatever you want with it, right? This is how things, how the, our environment can be completely redesigned, right? That's why this effort is important. That's the direction we're going to go to. Um, and that's because we think that software should actually get more approachable. Thank you. Or is the most important part is that you need to have that kind of visualizations in order to be able to achieve humane assessment? I, I think humane assessment is the most important one. How you implement things uh, is just one incarnation of that. Right? Thank the you. Abstract, the concept is the most important thing. So here's one thing I know. Um, I've mentioned this one multiple times before, but I actually get to speak with thousands of developers. And I ask them if they accept the idea that they read code, and they say yes for like more than 50% of their time, and they say yes, which basically means that this is one sing we're talking about one single activity, this is the most expensive thing where all the budget goes, right? Like huge amounts of money. And then I'm asking the second question, is that when was the last time you talked about how you read code? And they never do. So what we're talking about is that we are talking about a business, right? A domain, the whole industry that is, that is able to throw most of its budget on something nobody talks about. I'm saying the most important thing we have to achieve is to start the conversation. Because once we start the conversation, we have no idea what solutions are opened up afterwards. Imagine having 10 million developers innovating in this space. What would happen to software in that case? So it is not the implementation. The implementation is the beginning of the conversation. We want to be taken seriously. We also happen to be able to deliver value that nobody else can. But um, yeah. But does this imply that we need to change what we're doing underneath? Yes. Does this imply that we have to change what we're doing underneath? Yes. This will impact everything. You can you can just speak it out loud and I repeat it. Yeah. Okay. So you talked about this from the developer point of view and on the kind of the you talked about the investors and the business people involved. Have you even thought to uh, communicating like domain complexity at the 
uh, user level and the endpoint, so they have a, an opportunity to better understand complex business flow while they're using the software. Yes. Um, we need it for next year. <laughs> I need it. But yes, like the idea is that when people can relate to it, because again, it's not just enough that people could relate to what I just talked about. If the important thing is that you could relate to it in minutes. It's a whole new domain that you could understand in minutes, right? That's the amazing thing. So we show these kinds of pictures in different workflows and people, business people will say, that's a bug. That's amazing, right? You talk, we're not talking about first level support. We're talking about sales, per, you know, sales level first level support. Like sales people could debug the system. How amazing is that? So uh, this changed a lot of how we work in the industry, how we program, how people should learn to do this way. Right. So uh, one thing that, for example, Andre, uh, our colleague, is doing is um, uh, he's actually looking at how people learn to use these tools. And there's, uh, you know, like doing uh, ex controlled experiments exactly about that. So it is for this reason that we think examples are going to change this space. They already, there are very clear signs that this is, this is the case. On the one hand, examples are useful for, as I said, business. They are useful for testing. But they are very useful for learning a new area that you have never seen before. So simply bombarding you with a ton of examples. And then the problem of learning, in fact, turns out into a search problem. And this opens up all sorts of new opportunities. For example, what if I can look at your domain and maybe I use some AI and I recommend you, could you maybe look at this one? Just because I understand what your context is. The opportunities are so huge, nobody's explored those before because nobody had the data. So this is this is it's an amazing it's I think it's an amazing time. The last question, the last question. So have to, we have to go for the right hand. The last question. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you built the tools and the extensions and you say it was quite easy and it is useful. But uh, so how easy would it be for me and how much code would I have to read from your tools to, to build the extensions? You so the same kind of questions people ask when uh, programming was who came to, uh, into, the, into the arena, uh -huh. right? And then uh, Excel happened. And Excel became the most popular uh, user program, end user programming language in the world. Right? And it changed a lot of stuff. Um, and people didn't ask how do I learn it, is that they, they said, it is economically so profitable that there is no way for me not to learn it. That's, that's what we're aiming for. That's why we're saying that we're actually not building tools, we're building experiences. Our goal is to look at how you look, how you build things, and imagine new workflows that make it economically irresistible for you not to do it like that. It's not a moral thing. There is a moral debate behind this. Because right now we're constructing systems that are completely unsustainable. We're drowning in software. We have to change that one. I call this what a software environmentalism problem. But, um, but these moral, moral arguments never won. Economic arguments did. So that's what we are aiming for.